On Boxing Day 2013, Douglas was rushed to hospital. According to his wife, during the ambulance journey on the way to the hospital, he turned to her and he muttered, Goodbye, I done it, I don't want to be here anymore. There was also a printed piece of paper that he passed to the ambulance attendee. And this piece of paper were printed out, do not resuscitate declaration type thing. Once he got to the hospital, they did some tests and put him into an induced coma. He was in that coma for about two weeks and then he was brought out of the coma on the 8th of January. During that time, the test results had obviously come back and they said that he'd been poisoned with antifreeze. So it looked now, this guy that told his wife that he'd done it and he didn't want to be here anymore, he's got this dodgy do not resuscitate order, it looks very much like he's tried to take his own life. So when he came back round from his coma, the doctors, the police, the support workers were very keen to talk to him. However, when they did talk to him, things very much weren't as they seemed. Douglas were adamant that he didn't try to take his own life. He said that he certainly hadn't tried to kill himself and he really, really didn't drink any antifreeze. At this point, his loving wife turned and said, well, maybe you drank some blue liquid by accident. Hi, I'm Harley, and this is all I'm saying is, here we tell true crime stories, and then when I've got the spare time, I also like to tell a few stranger and fiction stories. The disclaimers before we start are a must. This is a true crime. It involves real people, and they have real families. So if you do share and you do comment, which I really do want you to do, please be a bit sensitive. This story is a bit different from the ones we've done before, because it's not an actual murder case. It's just an attempted murder case. This means the victim is still alive, so that puts me in quite a hard spot. And I'm sure I read somewhere that this guy didn't want to be Douglas. He didn't want to be noticed. He didn't want to be recognised. So I haven't put any pictures of him in the video. And I'm not going to disclose his full name. That also means the perpetrators aren't going to be named fully. And that's not to protect them so much. It's more to protect him because obviously they all share the same name. So on with the story. Douglas and Jacqueline had been married for 26 years. They had two children. They were Catherine, which was the youngest... And then they also had her eldest daughter, which doesn't really appear in this story. At the time of the case, Douglas was about 70 years old. His wife Jacqueline was about 54. And the daughter, the youngest daughter that we just mentioned, Catherine, she was about 20, give or take a year. And it's really hard in this story to get a grip of how family life were like before the incident. But it is said there were some domestic issues. It said there were a lot of issues surrounding Catherine's boyfriend. And I think I heard at some point that... I don't know if it were there Christmas Day or he'd moved in, but there were a lot of issues surrounding him. And it's also said that when Catherine was a child, she'd been physically chastised by her dad. She'd grown to become overly reliant on her mother, Jacqueline. It's also said that as a child, when Catherine had been naughty, she was physically beaten by her dad. Now that's quite an interesting line, because we've, we've now got this image that she was physically chastised, there were problems in the house, and whenever she'd been naughty, she'd been beaten. But I'm not going to stand here and say that somebody that hits the child on the bum is the worst person ever, he's domestically abusive. In most countries in this day and age, it is illegal to do. And I don't hit my children, and I don't think anyone else should. But at the same point, I'm not going to say that that person is domestically abusive. Because that plays down the really, really bad people. The, the Chris Watts, and the coercion, and all that... So I'm not saying it's okay, I'm not saying it's not beating, and I'm not saying it's not abuse. But I am saying we need to have a look at the evidence that we haven't got of how abusive they were, how much he beat them. Because let's face it, he's 70 year old, so I, I would imagine that he'd thought it were acceptable to slap him on the bum when he'd been naughty. And again, I'm not saying that's okay, I'm just saying that in the levels of abuse, he's not been controlling is not constantly beating her in his eyes it's a form of punishment and although i know a lot of people are now going that is abuse i'm not saying it isn't i'm just saying that it's not the domestic abuse that usually appears in these types of cases however that being said we can't rule out that it was domestically abusive we certainly can't say that it were because nowhere does it appear in this case that it were and Charges were it were suggested by Jacqueline and Catherine that he were abusive, but they later dropped from allegations. So whether they were saying it to clear their own back, we don't know. We can't demand that it were domestically abusive, and we certainly can't say it weren't. But 
in all transparency, in all fairness, and being as unbiased as I always try to be, there were somebody in court that was Douglas's child from a previous marriage, and they said that in that previous marriage, he were very controlling and he were very abusive. So we are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. There's no evidence that he were controlling and abusive in this marriage, but there is hints that it might have been. And we, we don't know what to extent that is. Because like I said, there were no claims in court of him being abusive in this marriage. It said that life were quite hard in that family. The marriage had been unhappy for quite a while. And that were leading to a lot of heated arguments. It were leading to a lot of constant frustration in the house. And I mean, that's quite expected in my opinion. We've got Douglas at 70. And then his wife, that's in the early 50s, there's quite a lot of differences physically, mentally, and socially between a 70-year-old and somebody in the early 50s. So I think the frustration and the arguments and the unhappiness is to be expected there. And it said that because of the total unhappiness, this is where it led to Catherine and Jacqueline's plan to kill Douglas. And it's largely said that Jacqueline took it upon herself to do all the work, she bought the stuff, and she tried to do it. But it is also said that Catherine persuaded her to do so. Before we get into the crime itself, if you don't know what Cherry Lambrini is, it's a 4% sparkling wine. It's fizzy, it's very sweet, it is very much like pop. And it's also quite cheap. So on Christmas night, Jacqueline was getting Douglas a drink of his Cherry Lambrini. Unbeknown to him that she'd mixed in the bottle some antifreeze. Now, antifreeze has two lethal substances. It has ethylene glycol, which can kill you in 24 hours. Now, even if a patient does survive, it's not going to be an easy ride. There's a chance that they'll pass little to no urine for the following weeks until the kidneys recover. The kidney damage might be permanent, and they might also have permanent brain damage. The other ingredient is methanol. Not menthol, methanol. And that's extremely toxic. I'm not going to tell you the exact amounts that you need because I'm not writing a manual, but you don't need very much to kill someone. The outcome of that obviously depends on how much they swallowed and how long it took to get treatment. But it is some nasty stuff. It can cause permanent damage to the nervous system, cause blindness, decreased mental functioning, and then a condition that's similar to Parkinson's. It's nasty stuff. And don't worry, we will go through a list of symptoms if you've been poisoned by antifreeze at the end of the video. But in Douglas's Cherry Lambrina, this antifreeze was almost unnoticeable. And due to the poisoning, it felt a lot more drunk than it expected to. So now in a seemingly drunken state, he took himself off to bed. The next morning on Boxing Day, he got up out of bed feeling very unwell and he collapsed. At this point, Jacqueline phoned an ambulance. She told them that in the past he'd suffered from kidney failure. And last night he had a couple of drinks, and that could have caused the condition to flare up again. So now the ambulance gets there, they put him in the ambulance, blues and twos all the way to the hospital. And while they're in the ambulance, Jacqueline passes one of the attendants a note. And it's a note that's been printed out, and it's a do not resuscitate. The printed note, which is apparently from Douglas, reads, I, Douglas, surname, do not wish to be revived, as I would like to die with dignity, with my family by my side. Thank you. Along with the do not resuscitate order, Jacqueline also said that during the ambulance trip, Douglas had turned to her and he muttered the words, goodbye, I done it, and I don't want to be here anymore. At the hospital, they did some tests on him and put him into an induced coma. Now, I think it was at this point when the results came back showing that he had antifreeze in his system, the hospital probably were a bit wary of how that could have happened and they formed the police. The doctor then went and informed Jacqueline that they had found antifreeze in his system and asked how that could have happened. She mentioned that he could have drank a blue liquid by accident and she also mentioned that he does like to drink alcohol out of containers that have been used for other liquids. Which is a really strange thing. I know people have strange habits and things but I mean most 70 year olds that I know like to drink their alcohol out of a glass or a mug. I know it might seem strange to see an 80 year old, 70 year old drinking out of a cup, but that's just the typical of what I, I know. And obviously this sent Dodgy to the doctor. If, if nothing else, why didn't she come forward and say this before? However, with this weird do not resuscitate letter and Jacqueline claiming that he tried to kill himself, 
but it really needed him to wake up and answer some questions. And speaking of that do not resuscitate order, the doctor looked at it and he noticed that it was printed off. It read nobody's handwriting. It weren't signed and it weren't dated. But then he also noticed that there was a spelling mistake. Luckily, because all the things I mentioned before, he already dismissed it. He kind of went, that it's not legally binding, leave it be. But this spelling mistake quite stuck with him. So when he passed it to the police, he pointed it out. Now, obviously, it's pretty much a dead end. I mean, Douglas could have made the spelling mistake himself. But this did become evidence later on. When Douglas came out of his coma on the 8th of January, he was informed of what happened. And he outright denied everything. He said he weren't wanting to take his own life. He hadn't drank antifreeze. It, it were all nonsense. He then revisited the evening of Christmas night and the morning of Boxing Day. And he said it was really strange how quickly he got drunk. He drank Lambrini before and he didn't get that drunk that quick. He also told the questioning police officers they were quite reminiscent of a day not too long ago. Three months ago in October 2013. That time he'd been left hospitalised for eight days. And on that occasion, him and his wife put it down to a bootlegger lager, some fake lager, dodgy lager or made lager, and a bad reaction to some medicine. So now the police are kind of going, right, well, there's loads of things here that aren't quite matching up. Least of all that you've drank antifreeze and it's happened before, what's going on here? And it weren't quite hard for them to find the first suspect. The following day, both Jacqueline and Catherine was arrested. Their accounts in the interviews were completely riddled with inaccuracies. And obviously the police had seized a phone. It's like first thing police do these days. Um, one of the things they found was an internet search on Catherine's phone related to antifreeze poisoning. And she says, yeah, no, that's easily to explain. My friend's dog had drank some. So I was like searching it up to see if it'd be okay and stuff. So the police went, oh, okay. And obviously later on, they went and asked this friend whether they'd ever drank, their dog had ever drank antifreeze. And this friend said that, are you sure you've got the right person? Because I've never had a dog. I don't have a dog now. Never had a dog in the past. You know, I, I ain't got a clue what you're on about. Jacqueline also went on in these interviews to say, yeah, I have bought antifreeze before. But I bought it for Douglas on two occasions. And that was because he asked for it. And at some point during these interviews, the police turned to Jacqueline and said, hey, can you spell uh, dignity for us? He says, yeah. Bit weird, but of course I can. D-I-G-N-A-T-Y. And obviously, instantly, the reason the police had been doing this was because Dignita had been spelt wrong on the Do Not Resuscitate letter. And Jacqueline had now just spelt it exactly the same way. Now, obviously, although that's a good bit of evidence, it's not necessarily instantly damning, especially on its own. But obviously, while they were looking through the phones, they didn't only look through the internet search, they also looked through the text messages. And on Jacqueline's phone, there were a lot of text messages to Catherine. Obviously, I'm going to read these text messages to you, and every single one is from Jacqueline to Catherine, mother to daughter. On the 26th of October, at 11.37 in the morning, she texts, I got the stuff. I will give him some later. Delete text. Tell no one, okay? An hour and four minutes later, at 12.41 in the afternoon, she texts, I'll give a little at first. I brought it so no one else gets involved. And then at 5.23 in the afternoon, she texts, I'm giving him some more at dinner. On November the 17th, 2003, she said, He feels sick again. I gave him more. Delete this. Then on the 28th of November, she put, Maybe someone could attack him when he goes to look at the car. Followed shortly by another text that said, Delete that. Then on Christmas Day 2013, at 9 minutes past 11 at night, Catherine texted, Dad's not feeling very well. Oh, and the cherry on the cake here, if the police didn't have enough evidence, they'd also recovered the bottle of Lambrini from their house, which had traces of antifreeze inside the bottle. As a result of the poisoning, Douglas had to learn to walk and talk again during a year of rehabilitation. Jacqueline and her daughter Catherine was initially charged with three counts of attempted murder, and an incitement charge was later added. In court, the prosecutor said, it was hoped that the lethal dose and effects could be disguised as an adverse reaction to medication during that period, or as a consequence of an attempt to take his own life. Catherine's surname knew and was aware that her mother was intending to administer to her father poison, and encouraged her knowing she would be endangering his life. Prosecution ultimately agreed to take a guilty plea for two counts of attempted murder by Jacqueline, and an incitement count from Catherine. The remaining charges 
were left. In court, the judge said, There were clearly premeditated and planned attempts to kill your husband. With a cold and calculated determination, you bought the antifreeze, you administered that poison twice. The effects of administering antifreeze can be particularly horrible. Antifreeze poisoning, even if it does not result in death, may result in loss of the use of the kidneys, blindness and deafness. After the first attempt you discovered that you had not given your husband enough to kill him and so you tried again. You typed out a do not resuscitate note which you handed to the paramedics. Your husband was unconscious, put in induced coma, in hospital for a number of days. You involved your daughter in this offending behavior and you attempted to turn the blame away from yourself. The Crown accepts that as a child Catherine was physically chastised but do not accept that Mr. Patrick's conduct was unlawful. The judge also said that the text messages shared between Catherine and Jacqueline showed that they knew what they were doing and they sustained it over a number of weeks. Following on that the impact on Douglas had been significant, leaving him with problems walking and speaking, a swollen neck, kidney damage, emotional suffering, his life had been totally ruined. He'd lost two years of his life and he was a changed man, both physically and mentally. Not only had he lost free stone in weight, but his overall appearance had changed drastically. The judge then turned to Catherine and he said, Catherine, your account to the probation officer included attempts to minimise your offending behaviour. You did more than simply answer texts and not stop your mother. He said her offending was aggravated in the fact that after the first attempt, she still didn't back out. Jacqueline cradled Catherine in the courtroom, in the dock, rocking her back and forth as they waited for the sentencing. As the jail turns red out, Catherine collapsed to the floor in floods of tears until she'd been led away by her mom. But Douglas didn't want any of this. He weren't vengeful whatsoever. The court heard that he didn't even want to pursue the case. He didn't want to see them put in prison and he didn't want the incident hanging over their heads. But in an impact statement to court, he said, I will never get over it. It broke me. I'm just a shell now. This was a person I was married to for over 25 years. A person I loved and love. Despite it all, I am still Jacqueline's husband and still Catherine's father. I almost pray for a suspended sentence or a tag. I cry all the time. I can't hold myself together. Jacqueline was sentenced to 15 years for each of the sentences to be served concurrently. And Catherine received a three-year sentence for incitement. And like I said, I'm sure that I saw somewhere in one of the papers... But Douglas said in court that he was really scared of being noticed and recognised out in public for this. And this is why I hadn't shown any pictures of him or his surname or anything. Because regardless of the domestic abuse and stuff, which weren't alleged in court and the judge didn't recognise him. This wasn't about that. This was about an attempted murder on him. Two attempted murders on him. So I respected them wishes. Although I couldn't find it again, I did look for the court to double check that one about the right case, and I couldn't find it, so better safe than sorry, I've just left them out. I also couldn't find any further information about Catherine in later years, but she was only sentenced to three years, and this court trial were in 2015, so she should be out by now, I presume. That's it, that's all I've got. And I don't know, like I've said, the hardest bit, and I'm sorry I mumbled on about it for a bit at the beginning, about the domestic abuse. But whenever a woman kills a man, we saw it with the Atkins in a previous video, that women find it right easy when they've tried to kill a partner to say, oh, you're domestically abusive. And that's why I didn't want to accept it. But at the same point, I don't want people thinking that I'm, I'm a sympathiser, because I'm not. I just It's important that we don't speculate and build imaginations to put somebody to be abusive when we weren't. Like I said, there is evidence that it might have been, but... They didn't even claim it in court, so we can't then claim it. Overall, regardless of whether you're abusive or not, it's a very sad case. If you were abusive, then it's a sad case for them to feel that they couldn't leave and they had to do it. If he weren't abusive and they just got fed up with him, then again, it's a really sad case. And although nobody died, it has ruined three lives. So that is four lives if you include the other daughter. So it is a really, really sad case. Now, as you know, I like to finish on a note where I can try and help if possible and I do domestic abuse a lot and I didn't want to do that again so I have put some symptoms of what you might be feeling if someone's tried to poison you with antifreeze because apparently it's a lot more common than I ever thought it were obviously I'm not a doctor and if you're not a doctor even if you are a doctor if you think you've been poisoned do phone 
an ambulance or whatever, speak to a professional. Do not use this information to self-diagnose yourself. Always speak to a professional. So if you have been poisoned by antifreeze, some of the symptoms may include rapid breathing, irregular breathing, or no breathing. Blood in your urine, no urine output, or very little amount of wee. Blurred vision or blindness, a rapid heartbeat. Low blood pressure, leg cramps, a coma, convulsions, dizziness, fatigue, headaches, blurred speech, stupor, which is apparently lack of alertness, uh, unconsciousness, unsteady to walk, weakness, blue lips and blue fingertips, fingernails, nausea and vomiting. If you think that someone might have been poisoned by antifreeze, the advice I read was to phone the emergency services straight away and do not try to make them be sick unless you are told by the emergency services, by a professional to do so. I repeat that again, unless you are told by a professional, do not take it upon yourself to try and make them sick. So that's it, that's this story, week's story over. Next week we have got the Halloween one that you wanted a Halloween story. It's quite an interesting story, I've already picked it. So until then, I shall see you next week. Bye.